Hello and welcome back again as we continue our study in our Father's business through the second half of Isaiah. Um, I encourage you to get your Bible and turn to Isaiah 53. We're going to be covering that today along with um, keep your thumb in 2 Thessalonians as well. And so um, we're just going to jump right in here. So to start with, I'm just going to open in a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you and praise you so much for your faithfulness, for your great patience with us, your great mercy bestowed upon us. And God, we thank you and praise you so much that you would call us children of God. Thank you for that privilege. And God, we just pray as we go to your word today that you would um, just um, speak to our hearts, God. We long to hear from you. And we just ask that you would um, lead us by your spirit through your word. And I just pray that um, it would glorify your name. And we praise you in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, we're going to jump right in. I'm going to start with actually 2 Thessalonians, and we're going to start with um, a verse towards the end of 2 Thessalonians to kind of sum this up. Um, in chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. The Lord be with you all. And um, how do we have peace in the midst of turmoil? And we know that 2 Thessalonians was written to persecuted believers, and so they were going through a lot of turmoil. And how would they? How could they have peace through those times? And um, as we sum up 2 Thessalonians to start with, just to, to give an overview of it, um, and that is to know um, that in every situation we can have God's peace in the way that we can. There's several things that they cover in 2 Thessalonians, and that is that we know the end of the wicked, um, that judgment is coming upon them, and that we know that God is a righteous judge, and he will do what is right. We also know that God holds us in his hands, and that we can be built up in him, and where it says, the Lord be with you all, and, and God is with us in every situation. And so because of that, we can have the peace of the Lord in our hearts. And we can also know the deepening of our faith through suffering. And so in all of these things, we can trust the sovereignty of God over our lives, no matter what happens. And so we can know his peace. We can trust his word. Um, salvation, we know, is a free gift to all who believe, but discipleship comes actually at a great cost. Um, and we're going to talk about that as well, that in discipleship, we are called to share in the sufferings of Christ. And a servant is not greater than his master, Matthew 10, 24. And so, you know, Jesus had to go through intense suffering. And so should we be surprised if we have to experience um, anything less than that? And God calls us to share in the sufferings of Christ, and then we can share in his glory as well. So we're going to continue in our study here. Um, last week, we talked about 1 Thessalonians, where we are built up in the faith until we are caught up at the rapture. But in the meantime, 2 Thessalonians talks about living worthy of his kingdom. And, um, and verses um, chapter 1, verses 5 through 6 says, And God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And so I want to emphasize this living worthy of his kingdom, that we don't, we don't earn salvation, obviously. It's a free gift, and yet discipleship comes at a great cost. And we want to live in a way that is worthy of the kingdom of God. Um, and so as we go through suffering, as we see um, through Second Thessalonians and Isaiah 53 especially, it's a familiar passage, um, but we want to cultivate a deep faith through a right response to our suffering. And um, that faith can be accomplished, um, come about through that response. And 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 3 through 4 addresses that. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. We proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness and all the persecutions and hardships you are suffering. And how can their faith be flourishing in the midst of intense persecution? And I think the, the key here is a right response to the suffering and, um, of course, the grace of God that sustains them through that, but that it produces endurance and faithfulness, that they have established a, a substance of faith, um, that the suffering is like the prickles. I have a, a thistle here showing, but it's like the, the prickles um, that are used as a vehicle um, to get them from one place to another, to grow them in their faith, to a vehicle 
to um, to glory eventually. And but in the meantime, we embrace God's sovereignty and trust Him for whatever He brings into our lives, and um, and so that our faith can be deepened and built up in Him, and that brings substance to our faith, so that when we do come to the ultimate trial of whether uh, we are called to die for Christ or not, that that faith will be built up, so that there is substance to the faith, so um, that we can persevere. And of course, it's all again by the grace of God. But First Peter one six through seven says, "In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials." These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So we go through these things to show that our faith is genuine. And um, and so we can be encouraged in this. And, um, and God calls us also to pray for one another as we go through these hard times in second. Thessalonians 1, 11 through 12 says, So we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you to live a life worthy of his call. There it is again, living a life worthy of his call. May he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. And then as a result, the name of our Lord Jesus will be honored because of the way you live, and you will be honored along with him. This is made possible because of the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. And so I like to think of, you know, those who are being persecuted across the world, we are called to pray for them. But I think of of how, um, in some ways, they are stronger than us who live in prosperity, than us who live with um, life a little easier, that um, actually there is great danger in prosperity, great danger to our faith, that it will become weak. And those who are persecuted have a strong faith because um, they have to um, know what they believe and put their faith in God and and go out on a limb, so to speak, um, with their faith. They, they have to trust God um, for that. And that faith is strengthened and made strong in that way. And so there is um, a danger to prosperity. And we need to be careful and make sure that we are um, responding correctly to what God brings into our life to, to build that faith. Um, we see the example of Jesus in Hebrews 13, 12 through 13. It says, So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So let us go out to him outside the camp and bear the disgrace he bore. For this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. And so we have this perspective of um, e- eternity. And we know that this this world that we live in now is not all there is. And so... Um, be willing to identify with Christ and be, um, are we embarrassed to bear his name or are we willing to suffer shame for the sake of his name? Um, and to, um, you know, Jesus bore the ultimate suffering when he went to the cross. And yet he knew the peace that transcends all understanding. And, and the way he could do that is, you know, peace was not the removal of that cross from his life, but peace was embracing that cross, embracing his father's will for him. And, and because of that, he alone is worthy to be seated at the right hand of God the Father and to receive the highest place of honor in, in, in all creation and beyond that, to be exalted to the highest place. And so um, we share in his sufferings. We go to him. We, we embrace what God brings into our lives. We share in the sufferings of Christ. So that brings us to Isaiah 53. Again, a very familiar passage, but we're going to just go through it. Um, it's very... Um, meaningful, very um, sobering, really. And so Isaiah 53, 1 1 through 2, it says, Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Okay, that's pretty powerful. Um, And, you know, it talks about it, the the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot. And I think of when he came the first time, he came as a baby, very vulnerable, very tender. And, um, and, And then like a root in dry ground. And that, um, as you all know, you've probably seen a flower bulb that, you know, is pretty ugly. And yet you plant that bulb and it grows into a beautiful flower. And and Christ was like just a a root out of dry ground, which is not generally very attractive. And so nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected. 
and uh, a man of sorrows. And when we are treated this way, when we are despised and rejected, um, we need to consider it an honor to share in, his, in the sufferings. If Christ was treated this way, um, there's no surprise when we're treated this way. Um, let's move on here. Isaiah 53, 4 through 5 says, Yet he, it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. So Jesus was not being punished for his own sins, as we know that Jesus had no sin, that he was led as a lamb um, to the slaughter um, for the sacrifice. And, and in the Old Testament, we know that, that when they brought the sacrifices um, to the tabernacle, they had to be a perfect lamb. There could be no blemish. It had to be a perfect lamb. And that was important because Jesus had no sin in him. He was perfect, and he alone because he was perfect, he alone could bear the sins of the world. And, um, and so God's justice was satisfied in that. And, um, and it had to be a perfect man. And um, Isaiah 53, 6 through 8 goes on to say, All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. And so, like sheep, we have gone astray, and yet it's, it's fitting that God would call himself the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that, that God calls us to bear suffering in the same manner, and um, and to look to the end, look to the, the end, and um, we know that the, the lambs, when they go to slaughter, they don't cry out like other animals too. They do. They are silent. And so Jesus went um, to, um, he gave his life willingly um, and bore the weight of the sins of the world. And he is able to bear that weight. And so um, we put place our faith in him and that's how we, we can have life as well. But um, that, yeah, that each of us have, have gone astray. We've chosen our own way and God... Um, calls us to live by his terms and live his way. And um, as we move on here, Isaiah 53, 8 through 9 says, Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone. But he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. And here we see some very specific prophecies that are fulfilled that um, that he was buried like a criminal. We know that he was hung on the cross with, with two other, uh, with two criminals, not other criminals, but because he had done no sin, but with two criminals and um, treated as a criminal as he was hung on the cross and bore the the curse of humanity, the curse of mankind, and then he was put in a rich man's grave. And we know that, you know, Joseph of Arimathea um, was and Nicodemus were the ones that. Um, asked Pilate to if they could get the body off of the cross and then he put Jesus in um, his 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 own grave Joseph of Arimathea and so it was he was a very rich man and so this was very much fulfillment of prophecy and um, and again think about if we are unjustly condemned um, what is our response and um, that it's very important to um, to hide God's word in our in our hearts to be prepared um, to have our Bibles taken away, to be prepared for great persecution, for suffering the way that Jesus suffered. And I, I have to wonder, are we, are we preparing for that in this day? Um, and, um, you know, we have our Bibles, but are we reading them? Are we studying them? Are we memorizing them? Are we hiding them in our hearts such that if this written word is taken away from us, we could still have that, the word of God in our hearts? Because it's through the word of God that we know God and um, that God reveals himself to us by his spirit. And so it's so precious to us and we dare not treat it lightly. Um, here, um, we can prepare for the kind of intense suffering that God may call us to go through if we are hiding the word of God in our hearts. Um, but also this, this um, to prepare for this kind of treatment, we need to be strong, like I said, in the word, in prayer and in fellowship. And, um, and yet this is all generally established in our private world. 
um, you know, we live in an age of public show where people, they, they want to, um, even their Christianity is, is a show, is, is all on the outside. And thinking that's all it's all about is, is a public life that other people can view us as being religious or righteous. And yet God says, you know, it's all about the heart. And there is no substance in outward show. It's only a shell. And so when trials come, if, if all we have is an outward shell of outward show, of Christianity, then we are going to fold when when trials come. We're going to be crushed when trials come. And God calls us um, to develop um, our relationship with Him in our private world. And Matthew six gives a lot of references to this, um, comparing the righteousness of of the Pharisees to what God requires. And in verse one, it says, "Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others." Again, God is calling us to, to um, a righteousness that is from the inside out, that is within, that he places in us, that he works out in us. And it's not to be just this outward shell of a show, um, to give our gifts in private. When we pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. When you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, then no one will notice that you are fasting except your Father who knows what you do in private. And your Father who sees everything will reward you. Again, so a faith that has substance to it that won't crush or fold in persecution and in hard times is actually built in our private world. And again, a faith built on outward show, it's only a shell and it will crush when hard times come. And, um, and so does our faith have substance? And this is an important question that we need to, to ask that, 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 you know, the int intimacy with God is exclusive, it's private. And uh, we need to develop that in our private worlds. And not that we never um, pray together in public, we do that as well, but it has to be, there has to be a substance of faith in our private world in order for us to, um, to be um, authentic and to be, um, and to be real in that and to have that, that substance of faith that can withstand persecution and suffering. And um, as we go on here in Isaiah 53.10, it says, But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. And I forgot to mention back in, in the other verse that it said that he was cut off from his descendants, and he was cut off in the prime of life. And it seemed like a defeat on the cross, and yet... It was a great victory because all those who place their faith in Christ are called the children of God. First John speaks about, you know, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are because by faith we are made children of God. We are adopted into his family. And so Jesus is given many descendants, um, more than can be counted really, that he will have many descendants. And so, um, it seemed like a defeat, and yet it was not, because in the end, God um, raised Jesus from the dead, and um, Jesus um, has many descendants, many children, and this is a great victory. And so, um, likewise for us, that that when we're going through suffering or, or hard times, that we can, if we can look forward to the end, I think of an athlete who goes through excruciating pain and pushes himself to the limit, just to win a race, to get to the end of the goal for, for that, and yet um, he 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 suffers and he goes through that that difficulty because he knows the end and he knows the goal at the end. And likewise for us, um, as we go through suffering, we need to look beyond the temporary, look beyond the things of this earth, and look to things eternal, and know that in the end we are on the winning side, and um, and so. Um, as we go on here, I wanted to, to look a little more at this verse where it says the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. It was the Lord's good plan. And, and um, should we be surprised then that this might be God's good plan for us as well to crush us and to cause us grief at times. And this is really to cause us to build our faith. Faith is a muscle, it has to be exercised. And we have to trust in God's sovereign plan. And as we go through these hard times, we know that God gives grace according to the measure of our need and he will sustain us. It is him who sustains us through these hard times that we have to look to him. We have to 
accept what he brings into our lives and embrace them rather than to resist that which he brings into our lives. You know, he calls us to cast our cares on him um, because he cares for us and he can bear the weight of every troubled heart. He can, he can bear the weight of it. And so go ahead, cast your cares on him. Um, cry out to him. And, and God says, you know, his grace is sufficient. But there, um, you know, if Jesus had to suffer, if it was God's good plan to crush his own son, to cause his own son grief, can we expect any less? And so we need to, during these days, um, be um, clinging to the Lord and building a substance of faith that can hold strong. And that substance is built um, through um, not only studying and remaining in the word of God and remaining in prayer and in fellowship with other believers, but also through suffering and a right response to suffering. Um, and so we have from 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24, it says this, For to this you were called. So we're called to suffer for Christ, because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to by his wounds you have been healed. And so we can endure, another way we can endure suffering is to understand that we need to leave justice to God. We, we can leave it in his hands because we entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. And we know that we have a righteous judge who will do right. And that, um, and God is watching over our lives and he is with us no matter what we go through. And so we can have great comfort and encouragement in that. And so back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 15 through 16, it says, With all these things in mind, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm and keep a strong grip on the teaching we passed on to you, both in person and by letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope, comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. So we have great comfort and strength in God and in the hope that he gives us of our eternal inheritance and of his presence with us in the here and now. And again, suffering produces substance to our faith and we consider it an honor to share in the sufferings of Christ. Um, but we do have an enemy. We have an enemy who is fighting against us as well. Um, and Second Thessalonians refers to this enemy. He says, don't be fooled by what they say for that day that is Christ's second coming, will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. So right now we have the Holy Spirit who restrains sin in the world, restrains sin in our own personal lives. The Holy Spirit holds back sin in our lives. And this is why we need to submit to him because the more of the fullness of the Spirit we have in our lives, the, the more um, we can um, be um, holding back that sin in our lives that, that like gravity just wants to sweep in. And, and by default, we return to sin just like we or by like gravity held to the earth and yet um the holy spirit like an airplane the power of an airplane that can defy gravity the holy spirit causes us to rise above that sin and to resist it and hold it back and so um we do have an enemy though and um as we get closer to the end to the second coming of christ we know that um there's going to be an intensity of the deceit, intensity of the lying, of the chaos, of the confusion, because we are getting close. Um, Satan knows we're getting close to, to the end and to his end. And so um, so the, uh, the intensity of our suffering, I think we can expect to um, get greater as well as we get closer to the end. So don't be surprised because we do have an enemy who is seeking to fight against us. Um, and yet, God says there will be a sudden defeat of this enemy. And we can find hope and encouragement in that. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 8 says, Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. There will be no competition. It's going to be easy for God to do this. Just with the breath of his mouth, the word of his mouth, 
God will overcome the lawless one. And so great encouragement there for those who are suffering. And I think of Revelation 12 and verse 11, where it says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And this is a way that we overcome as well, that um, that we um, claim the blood of the Lamb, that we are declared righteous under the blood of the Lamb, and we um, are forgiven under the blood of the Lamb. And so it's by his um, work on the cross that we can have victory in Christ and that we are seated with him in the heavenlies. And so the word of their testimony that uh, we can declare, um, again, the word of of what God has done in our lives and, and, and his presence with us. And um, and just as, you know, Jesus destroyed them with the breath of his, of his mouth, we have the word of God. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. We don't have to be afraid by, um, by not living in fear, um, by living by faith, we can be victorious over our enemies. And so there's great hope in that. And yet, 2 Thessalonians gives a warning to believers. In three, uh, verse 11 says, Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. And again, we are called to share in the sufferings of Christ. We are called to be about our Father's business. And um, we need to occupy until he comes, Luke 19, 13, and expend our energies toward that which is our Father's business. And again, what is our Father's business? To know Christ, to make him known, to be conformed into his image and our character, and and. and and to bring him glory. All this brings him glory. But also another aspect here is to build substance to our faith. This is our father's business. This is what he wants us to be about. Not to worry about what other people are doing or to, to be idle and just refusing um, to work or um, meddling in other people's business. And we need to expend our energies in the right place so we don't expend our energies in, in the wrong places. Um, and we need to live worthy of the calling we have received. And um, in um, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 says, God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Um, and so... In Matthew um, 7, 13 through 14, we learn that we can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. And so don't be surprised if you are not in the majority because the majority follow the easy way. They follow the wide um, the wide gate, the, the highway, which this in Matthew talks about the highway to hell is broad and its, its gates are wide and yet the gateway to life is narrow and few find it. And so um, we need to live lives worthy of the calling we have received. And so as we think about this word worthy, um, this is what I've titled this lesson is worthy. And this is why, because God calls us to live a life worthy of the calling we've received to share in his sufferings. And yet, um, when we think about worthiness, I think of Jesus who who alone is worthy to receive honor and glory and praise because in Revelation it speaks of this, you know, who is worthy to pour out the wrath of God upon the earth. And we, we often talked about um, in Revelation um, 5, it talks about, you know, who's worthy to break the seals and, and open the scroll. And I think sometimes we don't realize that that scroll contains the judgment of God, the wrath of God upon the earth. And so who is worthy to dish out the wrath of God on the earth? Um, it is none other than Jesus Christ, because uh, we know in the Trinity, we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but they are all one. They are one person. And yet um, we see specifically that the one who is worthy to pour out the wrath of God upon the earth specifically is Jesus, the Lamb of God, because he was slaughtered. He gave his life. He was the one that, that um, took on human flesh and was mocked and scorned and ridiculed, ridiculed and rejected. And, um, and so God the Son specifically is named as the one who will pour out the wrath of God on the earth. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And, um, 
because he uh, he bore the the curse of humanity on the cross and i find that very um very um touching or satisfying encouraging um to know that that god himself you know says that it is jesus who is worthy to um, pour out the wrath of God upon the earth. And Revelation 5 says, The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. It said, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, for you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And so what encouragement in that. We know the end, and we know that we are on the winning side. Isaiah 53, 11 says, When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. God was satisfied with Jesus' sacrifice on the cross um, because he was a perfect lamb. lamb. He was a sinless one. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. And again, great comfort and encouragement in that. And then we end with Isaiah 53, 12, where it says, I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for the rebels. And so we see here that, that um, you know, Jesus is given a, a soldier's honor uh, because Jesus went to the cross. He suffered death and bore the sins of many. And God calls us to live worthy of such a sacrifice. And um, again, we don't earn our way to heaven. And yet, um, as we share in Christ's sufferings, we prove that our faith is genuine in him. And God calls us to live worthy of such a deep, deep sacrifice that was given for us so that we could have life. And so as we share in his sufferings, we can also, God promises that we will share in his glory. And so I hope you were encouraged by this. And again, um, God calls us to live a life that is worthy of such a sacrifice. Um, thank you for being here and um, joining me on this, this journey through Isaiah 40 through 66. And um, next week we will work on Isaiah 54 um, with First uh, Timothy, I believe is the next book we got going here. So um, I will see you then. Thank you so much for being here.